For our final session of the day, we turn to one of the most pressing topics facing our society, climate. The next conversation will dig into what AI means for climate, both in terms of the carbon footprint of AI systems, but also how it might help us solve some of the greatest challenges related to climate change. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Mike Butcher, MBE, and our panelists are Dr. Mikhail Nakmani and Amberish Mitra. Uh, Rish is a renowned entrepreneur and investor, and he's the co-founder of Grey Parrot, which aims to transform waste into a valuable resource. Dr. Mikhail Nakmani is the founder and CEO of Climate Policy Radar, a not-for-profit organization on a mission to organize, analyze, and democratize data on global climate law and policy. She's also a policy fellow at the London School of Economics. And Mike Butcher, MBE, is editor-at-large at TechCrunch. He's written for UK national newspapers and magazines. He's spoken at the World Economic Forum and Web Summit, and he's interviewed many tech leaders and celebrities. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mike Butcher, MBE, Amberish Mitra, and Dr. Mikhail Nakmani to the stage. Hello, hello everyone. Is this thing on? Can you hear us? Um, oh, these bright lights. Oh, oh, hello. You're, you're miles away. Okay, right, I'm going to sit over here. Okay. Right, thanks very much for coming. Um, we're, at, we're at the cool, sexy AI Fringe Festival, right? So, uh, obviously, you know, we didn't get the golden Willy Wonka ticket, but, um, but you know, we're in the cool seats, that's for sure. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Um, uh, I, I think we've just been, had a bit of an intro, but let's, let's, um, let's remind you that uh, we've got uh, Amberish Mitra, who's doing Grey Parrot. We're going to hear from him briefly about how Grey Parrot is using computer vision, particularly to uh, look at the waste market. Um, and... Um, and Dr. Mikhail Nakamani is the founder and CEO of Climate Policy Radar. So uh, I'm just going to do some reorganizing. This is a bit awkward. Let's do this. Right, there we go. Now, um, let's do a couple of minutes. First of all, tell us what you're working on. Um, because I know that, for instance, uh, we've known each other a while, Amberish, um, and uh, you did uh, AR. You were very much an AR pi pioneer. Um, and using that technology, obviously, during that kind of AR boom and the metaverse boom, um, but it's so interesting that actually you've now passed that knowledge and some of that into this industrial world. So for those of us, uh, th th for everyone here who, who is not familiar with, with what Grey Parrot is, rather cool name, tell us what it is. Uh, thanks for the intro. So yeah, I mean, in my, in my previous life, I was focused on recognizing everything in the world. That was our vision and make it into an augmented reality experience. And our primary uh, revenue stream were from the world of uh, consumer packaged goods and brands. Um, me and my co-founder, we realized that actually, um, up to literally the last pixel of when you buy something is uh, someone in the world knows. It's digitized, it's mapped. And if you take the five, 10 big companies, they're able to predict what you're about to do next. And when you buy something and then there's a really like a dark abyss. What happens to the post-consumption world? Where does everything go? Uh, no one's measuring it. No one knows. It's like, if you think of it as like an hourglass, 10 super companies know everything you're doing. You're right in the middle, the consumer. Now when you throw it away. So the fact is that more than 93% of the world's recyclables don't get recycled. And it ends up in incineration plants and in our oceans or in our landfill which has huge environmental impact. And the big issue with that is we do not measure, and there's no digitization in the waste industry. So at Grey Parrot, we are using artificial intelligence and computer vision to analyze 100% of the waste flow in major cities in the world, and eventually want to do it for the whole world, and help waste management plants monitor, sort, and identify valuable materials so that it can be brought back into our communities. So give, give us a sort of picture. Is it simple, as simple as putting a camera on um, you know, the conveyor belt of waste going through a, a waste plant and going, that's a piece of plastic, that's an old washing machine, that's a whatever. Pretty much, yeah. Um, Basically, everything, sorting it, you know. everything we ever buy is some kind of a material science. It's up to like 100, 100 materials and we recognize all of it in real time. It's moving at three meters a second. And then we send signals to the mechanical, these are very capex heavy machinery, 
that how they can optimize sort and learn from it uh, so that it doesn't end up being thrown away. Which and how was it? How was it? How was this sort of um, done prior to this kind of technology? It was all manually? All, all, all manual. So and still, by the way, <laughs> we we are the disrupted majority of the industry still does manual sampling and all of the audit process and all of the government compliances are done through manual sampling. Right. Okay. Obviously, we'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, but Dr. Michal, you um, doing climate policy radar. Now, uh, obviously, cynical journalist here, uh, I'm, I, there, I, there's been a sort of proliferation of climate policy this, climate policy that, you know, institutes and heaven knows who. Um, so how are you going, how are you differentiate yourself from um, uh, what, what other kinds of initiatives in this space? Ooh, initiatives. Got to love an initiative. But um, so why policy? And what is, um, why does policy matter for climate and also for biodiversity, uh, two crises that are defining our challenge? Everything moves in one way or another through the lens of policy. So we either um, tax things, subsidize things, regulate things, um, including research, including that enables us to understand whether new technologies will come in faster and cheaper and all of these things. So we need to understand the regulatory landscape. We need to understand, we need to make better policies. We need to rip out bad policies. And we need to understand regulatory risk so we can move money to the right places, both within companies from um, old, let's call it the old economy to the new economy, both within and, and um, uh, amongst uh, organizations. So we need to read policy documents so we understand who's doing what, so we can understand what works and how to do it better. Right. But we find ourselves with very long PDFs I'm getting to the, what we're doing. We find ourselves with like 80 page climate policy documents that somebody needs to read, usually civil servants, researchers, uh, accountants, risk analysts in financial institutions. And you need to open them and then you have to control fine fiduciary duties, control fine transportation. People don't do that. Uh, people use anecdotes, which means, um, or don't read at all, which means that we end up with a very not evidence-based um, pyramid of decision making. Now, um, we're not in Bletchley Park, but Bletchley Park helped us understand that humans who are trying to, at the time, break German codes, if you do it manually, you're unlikely to do it at time. Um, because the clock is ticking on our uh, climate and biodiversity crisis, we need to read a lot of stuff and make sense of it really, really fast. So using AI, this is, the, this is where the AI comes in. Uh, we're reading stuff fast and making uh, and extracting structure from it. So we don't have to control find through very long documents anymore. So we can present a, think what Google Scholar did to libraries, right? All of a sudden you can find things that previously existed in places that you didn't know. You can translate them from lots of languages so we have a common language. You can start making sense of them. You can start having big data that you can see and say, oh, there's not enough going on here. There's too much going on there. How can we start making sense of that? Oh, I see. Um, some people might say, uh, surely, you know, there's uh, foundational AI now, like open AI, that is going to help us, you know, pass documents more easily. I mean, plenty of people, everyone here has probably tried to, you know, summarize this news article for me on open AI. Yep. Um, so how, how different to that? Uh, obviously, I'm sure it's much more sophisticated, but what is it different about what you're doing compared to what a foundational AI might be used for? Sure, so foundational AI helps us in what we do, but foundational AI that isn't human-centric is going to get it wrong. We've all tried ChatGPT and it's all, uh, and we still are getting it wrong. Um, large language models are great now at understanding a spoken language, but unless we speak to truthful data, then we're gonna get it wrong. So the curation and the, um, the creation of this, let's call it evidence base or structured data that is uh, truthful and verified, this is the policy document from the government of Angola. This is the correct translation of um, a, a term or a concept. These are things that have to be done by domain experts. If I talk about the just transition, which is how do we get rid of the old economy without screwing the workers, basically, uh, or the consumers because they all of a sudden have to pay for more expensive technology, you can't just control find just transition. You need a very layered um, um, uh, injection of, uh, of effort into that. So the, the foundational AI sits as a conversational layer on top of that. 
it helps us deal with it better. So we can ask it a question the way that we are now used to typing uh, our questions into Google or into ChatGPT or into whatever comes next, but it doesn't replace it. So these are complementary and not replacing each other. And one other thing is, a lot of the foundational models that we're seeing, like you named OpenAI, are closed black boxes. I don't know why I got the answer. We use open source models, yeah. um, and we use and we put all of our data and all of the models that we're developing out in the open, which means you can look at them and check for bias and say, hey, you missed that, and hey, this doesn't work, uh, which leads to a, a chain of improvements and innovation that can make this better. So Climate Policy Radar is a not-for-profit AI startup, and Correct. you said you're using a lot of open source tools, releasing some of your own. Um, why, why did you... Why did you, your organization choose not to turn it into like the kind of startup we might cover on TechCrunch and you know, raise millions of dollars and you know, do well out of it? Sure. First of all, we have raised millions of dollars, but in philanthropic capital, uh, which means that the only thing I'm giving them back is uh, the ability to slip, sleep better at night. Um, <laughs> because if you build for um, having to pay it back, you build a very different product than if you're building for public good. So building for public good first was the, was the only reason for, opening, for doing this as a not-for-profit. We're building for policymakers. We're building for people holding policymakers to account. The ability to tell them this is credible and truthful and we're not just finding ways for, let's name it, companies who wish to know what the regulatory landscape so they can you know, go around the compliance or find easier ways to, um, to get into markets that are not regulated yet. Yes, it is still open and these companies can use it. They probably don't need us, by the way, to do that, right? They can hire their lawyers and, uh, and regulatory experts to do that. But the ones who need the information the most are the ones who have the least access to it, the ones who can pay the least for it. So a strong climate justice angle in being able to reduce those information symmetries that sit at the heart of our injustice, um, at the unjust climate crisis and biodiversity crisis. Right. Well, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about that, and especially well, how fast we can get to, you know, some of these solutions. Mm -hmm. But let's sort of expand the discussion a little bit about out of things, um, climate and AI. You know, it's a general topic; it's pretty broad. Um, um, and I think the one, you know, people will be forgiven for going, perhaps, ah, wonderful. AI has arrived as this sort of magic bullet that's going to help us get address the climate crisis. You know, all of a sudden we'll be able to invent new materials which replace you know, carbon intensive things like plastic or whatever it is, or um, there was a wonderful example about uh, Google working with airlines to reduce the contrails, uh, which contribute to, um, uh, you know, carbon in the atmosphere uh, by 20%, you know, sort of a magic bullet, you know. So I, I assume that you come across people all the time going like, oh, this is going to be great, fantastic, that, oh, you can sort all the plastic out on the industrial way is marvellous, off we go, bish bash bosh, um, we can all relax. So um, to some extent, it's obviously such a wonderful and transformation of technology, it is going to be great, shall we say, but we are really at the bottom of the, you know, crawling out of the bottom of the ocean at, at this point, aren't we? Yeah. Um, it's going to take a long time. Um, the thing is, uh, <laughs> amazing thing with AI that a lot of scale is possible, but you need uh, good intentions and a good stakeholders around it. So you, if, if governments or uh, the buyers of the goods and services are skeptical and they measure it against uh, much more traditional, like either human or other kind of web services and APIs available, and compare it to some kind of statistical modeling, uh, then the challenges are harder. Because I, I always translate AI as not like a replacement of human intelligence, but it's more like intelligent assistance. It's here to expedite massively. Talking about climate and AI, the fact is, uh, like without sounding pessimistic, the world is burning, and it's a serious issue and time to have conversation, discussions, 30, 40 year view is running out. So I, I speak to material scientists all the time because everything goes through our plants. So even whether, whether, it's, whether it's fully compostable or not, it will be thrown in a bin. You know, the consumer is not gonna go and put it in a garden, right? So 
and it still needs to come through a waste infrastructure. So when you're validating, if anything is being done by less than 1% of the world, in reality, this will not save the world, what we're trying to do. So I think the argument in favor of AI is it can massively improve efficiencies in a lot of existing processes and give us a chance that, you know, today's traffic light system, today's weather monitoring system, today's waste management processes, today's packaging quality, so that you, you don't have to invent uh, a new plastic. You just go and use minimum layers of plastic, go mono material, because end of the day, the world of CPGs are driven by marketing, you know, and, and they, they signal you with a lot of colors, which introduce a lot of elements into those packaging, which is not really required. So the point I'm trying to make is a lot can be done, but the stakeholder needs to really buy into the impact of it today and not have just a 50-year view and, and just leave it that actually some people will figure it out, some smart stuff is happening, and not take accountability for it immediately. Right. To me, the, the most incredible potential of AI that I see is the ability to connect and de-silo. And um, you're working in waste, I'm working in policy, other people are working in predicting uh, solar uh, energy production, other people are working on, um, I don't know, fit, uh, housing efficiency, other people are working on agriculture. The ability to take all of these um, crazy huge uh, data sets and models and connect them all together, that I think is, is our potential. Because if you look at the um, advancements of attribution science, which means um, how can we attribute um, certain weather events, for example, hurricanes or floods to human activity, and with that we're able to hold to account fossil fuel companies, and we're all of a sudden connecting consumer uh, patterns because we're able to monitor emissions in real time using satellite imagery, something that a coalition called Climate Trace does. And we do that with um, uh, climate scientists working on that. And then we actually monitor social uh, and sociopolitical impacts and health impacts of affected areas. And we're starting to be able to draw the lines between those. That's where we can start um, not just saying, okay, I'll replace plastic A for plastic B, which will be more efficient, because we'll be able to see the large societal changes. One of the interesting things here is seeing how this can impact financial systems. We're used to measuring things and saying, ah, oh, when a company does X, usually it does better on, um, um, in, you know, it's in, bot in, in its bottom line or double bottom line or triple bottom line if, uh, if we're really lucky. But um, increasingly, we're able to start seeing how more sophisticated things or things that are not traditional, how we can start factoring those in and start moving the financial system through the mechanisms that it's used to, which is like big data driving, I don't know, uh, models and, um, and um, things like that. Do you, have, um, do you have a kind of uphill battle trying to convince uh, people to uh, look, you know, do you have to go out there and sort of sell yourself the market, as it were, or do you have people knocking on your door going, give us these models you've got, give us the, sure. give us the read on the legislation that you've got. Right, so we're uh, radical collaborators and being, uh, being a not-for-profit makes us kind of um, obvious for that. We work through credible channels, so we are partnered with UNFCCC and um, uh, find ourselves in, um, um, you know, on the stage at COP next to UNFCCC directors um, talking about um, the naturally determined contributions and how we can help read them faster because before that it was, you know, they were in lots of languages and in UNFCCC portals, and that's UN Climate for anyone who's not familiar with the acronym. Um, we're partnered with the London School of Economics. They have a repository of, um, of climate documents that we now run using our, uh, um, using our models. They have 330,000 users every year, so that's you know, through, through a credible channel. When you come with uh, good intention and with radical collaboration, I find that people knock on your door and not vice versa. Yeah, I, I think that's probably, being a non-profit has, has got a great op opportunity in that. Um, but how are we doing on the kind of transition? Because 
you know, hopefully um, applying AI models um, of any description, certainly this new, new wave of generative AI, which as a journalist has been covering tech for a long time, I've never seen anything so really so so uh, transformative, a lot in technology. You know, we went through the whole big data era, but this is a whole, whole nother, another level. Um, but how are we going to be doing on the transition? You know, is the pace of transitioning using AI going to be fast enough uh, to get us where we need to be? What do you think, Ambridge? I, I feel like um, one way or other, AI was a thing in the backdrop for a lot of people, and in a way, Chat GPT has brought, it's been an ambassador of change where masses you know, <laughs> know how to use it, and also whether they like it or not, have respect for it that, hey, this is a great response and language synthesizer, even if it's incorrect, it's like an amazing DJ of all the knowledge and give me something that gives me some meaningful structure. So it's been a great ad, uh, and I feel Many industries, uh, particularly the one we represent, need to adopt that technological advances for rapid change. And this is playing as a good. So I would think a lot of people who are on the fence now really believe that, hey, this is really smart and, and, and change can happen. And if my respective company or industry doesn't accept it or go with it, we will be redundant. I think that awareness uh, has really gone up uh, and, and people are, people are like really keen to bring it into their organization and, and they feel like it's not something that far, like some techie guys use as a Google API and does it, it's gone to people's doorsteps and, and, and we will see much larger adoption often in all industry sections. Uh, to yeah, be it's a, I'm sure in the work that you're doing, uh, the fact that ChatGPT exists it means at least that's that's a gateway drug into sure. into how you present what you're doing. Absolutely, but I want to I want to argue a non-traditional point here, which is um, data is not going to be the linear thing that's going to save us and that's going to dig us out, uh, help us climb out of the hole that we dug for ourselves, or the burning hole that we dug mm -hmm. for ourselves. Um, they're going to be tipping points, and those tipping points are critical. And um, I don't know, shutting down the fossil fuel industry would be a nice start, right? Um, that, that would be a tipping point. And you don't need much more AI for that, right? We kind of know everything that we need to know. You don't need many more data points in order to argue that point. So how many more companies do we need to measure their, you know, their very particular emissions? So tipping points, by the way, for good and for bad, so the positive tipping points and the negative tipping points are going to be critical in this. Um, but then we have the hard work. You need to decarbonize uh, stocks of houses. You need to make energy efficient choices in uh, transportation and in, uh, um, uh, and in agriculture. These are um, tons of micro points, micro decision points. And for that, we're going to have to work very hard. So there's going to be tipping points. Policy is going to be one of those levers that's going to enable change at scale. So this is, we went for the biggest lever. We hope that if we pull it fast enough, then we can generate some of those uh, kind of um, uh, knockover effects. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and we need to remember, again, going back to the data is not enough story. Um, we need humanity injected with, the, with AI, not only for the ethical choices that have to, uh, to come with it, because ungoverned AI machinery uh, is not going to help us. Uh, we're, I mean, it might help us just in the wrong direction. Um, we need to make sure that there are humans connected to these and that we don't say, okay, let's build bigger and faster and deeper, um, but without the governance mechanisms around that. Well, I mean, obviously the, the big theme of the week is AI safety and there's all sorts of communiques potentially being issued uh, as a result of what's going on this week. But, um, and you know, and to some extent, it's about uh, you know, uh, you know, putting the humans in the loop, as it were, uh, in over AI policy and regulation. Um, um, is there a danger uh, with that in mind? Is there a danger that we uh, apply AI in the, in the, to climate in the wrong way, or um, or is it all of it good? I think the only danger we have as humans is we 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 have to redefine for a moment not what AI is actually, what to be human is. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I think how the society is defining, if the society keeps defining its existing success factors of you know, 
GDP growth and share prices and all those things, we will, whichever way we design AI, it'll cater to those indicators, mm -hmm. which only still leads to consumption and growth well, the I mean, indicator. There you go. I mean, <laughs> and there is actually, um, you, you know, there are, there are, you know, large uh, oil companies, for want of a better phrase out there, who are saying, yes, it's, everything's going to be fine. We'll be able to use less and less oil. We'll just <laughs> carry on using oil. Um, we've, we've developed a far more efficient combustion engine using AI, for instance. You know, isn't that not going to be a kind of quite a mellifluous argument uh, in the future? So the, the beauty of transparency is that it enables us to see that that's bullshit, right? I'm allowed to say bullshit on stage? I just did twice. Sure. Um, uh, I think the, one of the risks is that, um, um, just like you said, that our ethics is wrong, right? You can use your Google Maps to get somewhere in the shortest way or in, you know, without a toll road. Yeah. Um, you can decarbonize at a great social price, right? You can decarbonize by kicking people off their land and building, so, and building uh, solar farms, right? Um, you can decarbonize by making energy not uh, affordable to, uh, to millions of people. You can decarbonize and flood a valley because you're now um, and, uh, at a biodiversity uh, loss. You can do a lot of things wrong. Uh, wrong means different things to different people. So being able to um, separate what is the data and what is the ethics that govern the use of the data, that's critical in signposting that. Now, I'm not going to decide for any government what is right for them. Um, I really hope that we have some shared, like you said, uh, concept of what is human, but it's really clear that it's not the same thing. What I'm really afraid of is biases. Even things that are good intentioned are, can be biased. Um, and um, by applying data with a biased way, by a biased lens, by not having, um, um, and I'll, I'll speak to the example that I know best, which is language. If we translate stuff wrong and then we, and then we say, you get X points um, and therefore, um, I don't know, your credit uh, risk or your credit uh, rating will be Y and therefore the price of something uh, will be higher or lower. But actually, I don't know how you uh, talk about this term because you talk about it in a different language or in a different way or you come from a community that describes things differently. You might be losing points over something that you are actually doing. You might be penalized because the model is biased. So making sure that we are um, being extremely aware of that. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm banging about transparency and um, taking things out of the darkness and into the light as, um, as one of the uh, counter um, uh, measures to all of the risks of AI or to many of the risks of AI, I think, that are out there. Mm. Um, we, we have time for questions, but so if you want to um, have a question, then just uh, have a think about what you would like to say. But I'll, I'll give you a little, uh, an, another, throw you another quick, quick question to give you all time to think of something to, to, to ask. But what sort of things keep you up at night? Are you worried about the fact that perhaps, you know, it's not going to be fast enough, that, um, uh, that maybe there's maybe an oversell on what AI is really going to be capable of doing and addressing in... Uh, the climate crisis, Ambrish. So my take is that the word AI is like overused and one way it's used as if, you know, like uh, it, it's taking over the world and it's some kind of a super intelligent, but I, I really believe that we, most people who are really uh, working uh, uh, in the AI field are solving problems with a very clear purpose and application. Uh, and, and people are doing it on all levels, from saving forests to uh, looking at recycling of clothing materials to rethinking of material sciences. Uh, and, and those people are really worried uh, about future resources, uh, resource optimization, what impact on the planet, uh, reducing waste at all levels because we have uh, a finite amount of energy and, and, uh, and also it has a big environmental impact. So what keeps me uh, awake at night that there are solutions today uh, which can divert you know, 5%, 10%, 15%, 15% of waste in a scale of one to two years off oceans back into the community. But the change of pace is not going to be that fast just because how humans make decisions about things on, on KPIs, businesses, right. metrics, which is all connected to your that year's 
fiscal goals, you know, because we are all still driven by growth-related metrics. So we, we are choosing to grow over trying to save the planet. Right. Well, that's a whole other topic, <laughs> the, the growth, degrowth. What, what, what keeps you up at night worried? First of all, if I don't sleep at night, I can't function the next day. Mm. So I try, I try to sleep full nights. And I'm saying this as a person who's worked on climate for 15 years. So there's plenty to keep me up at night mm. uh, because the problems are big. What keeps me up at, um, well, what worries me deeply um, is that uh, we still have a handful of uh, small, uh, a very small handful of very powerful players who are using whatever is at their um, uh, ability to try and um, derail the efforts to make this planet a livable and wonderful place for all of us that it can be um, by uh, vested interest. They are using all of the dirty tricks on the book. And what worries me is actually the use of um, AI and deep fake in order to tell stories and put some people to sleep and, um, um, and create a conflict where that is not necessary. So those are the things that wake me up at night and I'll end with a, like a especially gloomy one, the, um, uh, the energy and the geopolitical risk uh, keeps me up at night and I'm not sure that AI is going to save us from that. Yes, um, well, that I'm not sure that I'm not sure if there was a panel on AI and disinformation. There probably was, and if there wasn't, there should have been. Um, we could talk about that. Um, let's have some questions for people. Go, go ahead if you can, sir. I think we've got appears to be a microphone heading towards you. Go ahead. It helps if you say who you are and what affiliation you have. Thank sure. you. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Matthew Blamore. I'm an AI consultant for AI Caramba. Um, I guess I, my, my question is regarding, obviously, the AI Safety Summit happening in Bletchley. Um, how do you both feel about the fact that it's focusing on frontier AI um, and not necessarily the immediate challenges that we have with AI? And, and what do you think the government can do to, for example, encourage the adoption of your incredible technology, uh, a grey parrot, um, to solve some of these climate issues? I mean, uh, I'm in a, like... In very unique to me, and we are representing at Bletchley Park, so the government is acknowledging uh, our, our impact uh, to the UK and the European waste industry. But I think the, the scaremongering of generative AI or overall, like what it'll uh, do uh, as a... It, it, there is, I mean, the thing is, uh, I'm quite deep in the industry, and I feel that... Uh, once you work in it long enough, you actually respect the human existence so much more. And it is so, it, we are still so far as much it is said that uh, so many dots to connect to create such a super intelligent system. And I, I, I still feel that uh, there's a lot of commentary on uh, how quickly this would happen, where uh, in my opinion, it's quite far. But I think it's government's rightly role because historically, all kinds of mess ups that have happened, it's been, we've all been very, react I think for the first time, uh, generally noticing that before a sort of global AI universal movement happens in all walks of life, so much of the participation of the audience and the government, and this is a good indication uh, in a way to be inclusive uh, and to drive a conversation before we see that world. Uh, normally, you know, all other movements, whether it's nuclear or other, these are all post-reaction. So I, I would see that as an encouraging thing. Are, are you mm. are concerned about the fact that um, the summit's so, you know, obsessed with foundational AI, frontier AI risk, rather than maybe some of the more practical issues we might be talking about here? No, because I think the practical issues, um, we have the tools to solve. Um, we need to talk about it, and here we are talking about it. I think um, foundational AI is exactly where the boundaries are blurred between, uh, let's call it, tools and ethics, right? Um, and that is something that we need to talk about, um, ideally not in closed doors with only certain people in the room, right? These, are, uh, these need to be inclusive conversations, and having this event today is, uh, is opening that is, uh, is critical, and I really hope that now, we do need to have conversations where people make decisions and make laws and policies that, you know, that govern these things. Um, that's not going to be enough, though. But I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with, um, with dealing with foundational AI as a thing. 
We've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Go ahead. Um, we've got two right there um, in my line of sight. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, this is in response to what Michal was saying about disinformation. Um, I work for a company called Valent Projects, and we kind of uh, we use AI and other tools to kind of monitor disinformation um, online. Uh, what are the main challenges, do you think, when it comes to climate disinformation? What are the main kind of uh, um, angles people are using and the kind of uh, the tactics they're using that you're seeing? And how do you see policy as a way to prevent that? Climate disinformation. Right. Let's do. Then there's one. Let's do two at once. There was another one. If you keep your hand up, sir, and just. Um, We'll just squeeze the next next question in as well. We can handle both. Hi, um, I find the relevance of AI to climate change prevention conversation really detached, because the reality is we've opened 150 new licenses in this country, and we're burning through ridiculous amounts. And China and um, India aren't slowing down either. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any more optimism about adaptation and things like uh, weather forecasting implementation of AI. But are you basically? either realistic or cynical enough on either spin you want to accept that AI is not going to close down Rosebank and these enormous new oil fields the UK government's just launched? Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, AI's That's not going to close down the oil fields for any time soon, is it? Absolutely um, not. Um, are you happy for me to, to, go for it. Give, to, to give it a shot? Mm. Okay. Um, greenwashing, lobbying um, are two of my first answers to, to the first question. Um, being able to see what is the gap between what uh, institutions, people, corporations, governments promise and what they actually do is something, and making that transparent is a powerful tool in order to uh, create accountability. So um, I'll give you two examples. One, uh, a country promises something in its nationally determined contribution. That's a letter that governments send to the UN every few years and say, this is what we're gonna do. Do they legislate on it? Is there a policy? Do they put budget against it? Where is, where is that trail that helps us see if people deliver on their promises? That's one thing. Uh, companies um, have these nice glossy uh, sustainability reports with little girls in dresses running in fields and saying how wonderful they are and how much they supported their community. How much money did they put in it? Can we see that? Can we find out? Can we tell their investors? Can we tell their investors when companies do that, this is what happens? Um, these are some of the ways that, um, that we can do that. Disinformation is sometimes in absence of information, and sometimes it is in actually uh, touting uh, like uh, sheer lies. Uh, the ability to track that is critical. Uh, to the second question, I am 100% with you in all of that. Um, uh, climate change is, uh, or like this, you know, what we call climate change is made up for me uh, from three parts. Um, mitigation, reducing emissions, adaptation, dealing with the mess we're already locked ourselves into, and loss and damage, which is uh, paying compensation for uh, what we cannot fix anymore. Um, the more we do of the first, the less we have to do of the second and the third. The more we do of the second, the less we have to do of the third, right? That's, that's basically, and every molecule matters and every fraction of, uh, fraction of temperature matters and every human that isn't uh, drowned in a flood matters and all of that. So, um, Data is not the panacea to that. But the lack of data and the lack of um, uh, tools and uh, weapons in the hands of activists that can help battle this, help take corporations to court, help take governments to court, help um, uh, tell people how it is, give real information to people that say, when you do this, then all of those oil majors yeah. that say, um, of course the combustion engine that I invented is great. So data is not enough, but it can help um, move the needle. And presumably if you can argue that, um, you know, continuing with um, oil wells is going, actually going to be uneconomic, exactly. and you can prove it, then we're halfway there. Uh, you've and, got and majority, a very short amount of time, yeah. Abrish, go And ahead. I would say like majority of the data is actually coming from AI. You may not realize that the huge amount of processing that is happening today of unstructured data. So an incredible amount of reports are being written and the majority of the climate reports also that come out. Uh, some le level of uh, AI algorithms go into it. The only other thing I'd like to add from a, a government's perspective that governments are keen on making policies. In UK and Europe, we're already seeing something called extended producer responsibility, where every packaging brand in the world, and this is a CEO level problem, 
that by 2025, which is very soon, they have to take responsibility for the full life cycle of the product. So from manufacturing to where it ends up. So if a Coca-Cola can and seeing, seeing burning in a turkey beach, Coca-Cola is responsible for it. Uh, not the consumer, not anybody in the middle. And, and, and for that, they really need to make a, a lot of changes. But of course, government cannot penalize or, or, or create a, a carrot or a stick for those brands so, to say that, hey, you're doing well and you're not doing well without some level of insights in between. So even though the policy is trying to make some progress, uh, we still need a lot of smart measurement. So you need all the actors to play its own role, and AI has a big role to play here. Well, hopefully it will play a bigger role and um, solve some of those pressing issues that we're all concerned about. Uh, but for now, uh, please um, thank uh, Dr. Mikhail Nakmani, who's founder and CEO of Climate Policy Radar, and Amberish Mitra, who's co-founder of Grey Parrot. And from me, Mike Butcher, TechCrunch, thank you very much. Thank you.